How you doing? Seb here from Circuits and Sounds. I welcome you to the second part of episode one, Sound Shaping and Mixing, where we'll take a look at the triple toasted oscillator, the MS20 style filter, and the mixer. I realized that it was gonna take quite a lot longer than I anticipated to cover everything in this box. So I figured I'd break the episodes up in a smaller 15 to 20 minute chunks just to try and make it a bit easier to digest. But before we get started, I just wanted to show something I forgot about in the last part. Just this little key switch down here for the power. When I originally installed the key, it only controlled a single power supply which turned on all the modules at the same time. But the problem was that the modules were consuming quite a lot of juice. So I had to get a second power supply in there to try and give it a bit more of a boost. But the problem now is that the key only controls one half of the synth. So the LFO turns off, the mixer turns off, but everything on this side is still turned on. So that's on my list of jobs to figure out. How I can have the key control both power supplies at the same time, so then all the modules can light up like a Christmas tree at the same time. So before we start and have a look at the triple toasted oscillator, the MS20 filter and the mixer, first I should explain what the concept of patching is and what a patch cable is. Well, a patch cable is just a cable that's plugs on the end. But patching is the process of interconnecting all the different modules with our cables to create the sound that we're looking for. But just one more thing, I know, I'm sorry, I keep stalling. But I can't stress enough that all of these modules are lo-fi, meaning that there was no preciseness or calibration to any of them. They're all made from completely analog circuitry. There's nothing digital about it at all. Okay, that's a bit of a lie. This Unison switch does have a couple of digital logic chips behind it. But what I mean is that there's no microcontrollers or Arduinos or anything like that controlling any of these modules. It's all purely analog. Which is kind of fun, because you make a sound one day, and then the next day it's sound completely different. Mostly due to the transistors and a couple of the modules just being a bit iffy with temperature fluctuations. Especially here in Australia. So the first module that we'll talk about is the mixer just here. We have seven inputs, which was originally meant to be eight, but we'll get to that in a minute, that then go to one common output. Each of the inputs and the output can either have their signals muted or killed, and we can also adjust the level or the volume. As you can see, the whole thing is wonky as all hell, and the paint is scratched, and we have this random hole at the top here. This is the very first module that I ever made. And I didn't really measure it properly or account for the little bits of wood at the top here to be able to hold it in place. So when I went to go and put it in, I realised that it had turned the whole thing upside down. And it meant that this little hole here, which was meant to be the original output, is now just stuck at the top. And I then had to use one of the original inputs to become the output. I also got the wiring for the level controls back to front, so when we turn it to the right, it actually turns the signal down rather than turns it up. But the whole thing works, so it doesn't really matter. So let's just quickly look at the circuit diagram for the mixer, just so we can have an idea of how it works. And then we can finally start and put some signals in, just to put all this talk into practice. So I've pulled open KiCad here, or KiCad, however you say it. And what we basically have is an op-amp being used as an inverting summing amplifier with a gain of one. And then a second op-amp being used as an inverting amplifier to re-invert the signal back to the original. We have our seven inputs on the left here, where we can connect our signals to be mixed, which is then connected to a single pole double throw switch, where we can either connect the signal onwards to the op amps or just have it disconnected entirely, which is how we achieve our mute function. The signal is then also connected to the top of our 100k pots, with the bottom leg connected to actual ground at zero volts. So we can get our level control by adjusting the input to the summing amp between the signal or absolutely nothing at zero volts. The signal is also connected through an AC coupling cap to block any DC elements in the mix, therefore avoiding clipping or distortion. On the right hand side, we have the exact same setup as on the inputs, so we can kill or adjust the level of the final output signal. Alright, so with all that being said, let's start and put some signals into the mixer, and we'll see how we can adjust and mix all the inputs into a final output. So to show how we can mix some of these signals, this is where the TTO comes in. 
I'm calling it that from now on because triple toasted oscillator was quite a mouthful. But before we start to have a look at just what kind of sounds this thing can make, let's pull out our old friend the dictionary and have a look at what the word oscillate actually means. Storm, haven, Cantonese, we must be close. Oscillate, physics of an electric current to vary between minimum and maximum values. Well, that's what the noise toaster is. It's three copies of the same oscillator circuit from the noise toaster, where we either get a ramp or sawtooth wave and a square wave that varies between a minimum value of zero volts and a maximum value of 0.6 volts. We can also adjust the frequency from a slow click up to a much higher frequency tone. We also have a white noise generator and a couple of CV sources for the frequency. These two here control all three of them at the same time. And these three down here can control the oscillators independently. We also have a sync in jack where we can apply a signal to reset the waveform to the beginning. And finally we come to my pride and joy, the little unison switch down here, where we can set the oscillators to work independently, or we can flick it down and control all three of the oscillator's frequencies with the one knob. All right, so now that we have an idea of what this thing can do, Let's start and put some signals into the mixer so that we can finally start to hear what it sounds like. And then we can start and apply some modulation sources like the LFO or the envelope generator to start and play around with the frequency. Alright, so I've got the triple toasted oscillator patched into the mixer. And at the moment I've got it set to independent mode. So if I unmute the signal, we can hear a sort of chord coming through. But I can adjust each of the oscillator's frequencies independently. And then over on the mixer, we can either mute them or adjust their levels throughout the mix. So let me just quickly hit this unison switch to demonstrate how we can control all three oscillators' frequencies with the one knob. Flick it back. And we can adjust them independently again. And in unison mode, these knobs also do nothing. They're completely disconnected from the oscillator circuits until we reconnect them back again. Honestly, I just play with this all day. So let's mute this and move on. Now I should also point out that I'm only using the round waves to demonstrate the TTO. The problem being that the square waves have quite a lot less amplitude, so even jacked up to full volume we still can't quite hear it. And this is a feature of the oscillator itself, and something that we'll have a look at a bit later on. Alright, so let's start and see what happens when we put some modulation into the TTO. I've got the LFO connected through a patch cable here, but let's first unmute the signal. And we can hear there's a bit of a chord going on. But let's connect this into the LFO in. And now you can hear how the rest of the LFO is affecting the pitch of the TTO. We can also flick it to unison. And let's see what happens when we put it into the envelope generator input. And you can hear there's a bit of a different response to it. And this is due to the way that the pots have been wired, which we'll again look at a bit later. change this from the LFO to the envelope generator, where we can adjust both the rise and the fall of the control voltage.
Let's try it in the elbow in again. <laughs> it's just absolute madness. What is going on here? Just absolute madness. Alright, let's keep moving forward. So let's have a listen to what the TTO sounds like with both the LFO and the EG connected as our modulation sources. So let's unmute the signal. And you can hear that the LFO is stepping the pitch up and down as well as the EG rising the pitch up and down independently as well. So the two sources are mixed together to affect the modulation. We get to unison. Now what happens if we swap the modulation sources? Put into unison. This is just something else. Let's mute that. Alright, so let's have a look at what happens when we take a signal and put it into the sync in input. I've got the envelope generator creating a very fast control voltage connected into our patch cable. So let's unmute this signal. We've got that nice unison tone. But let's connect this to our sync in and do the same thing, sweeping the frequency. Just absolute madness. Let's mute that. Alright, so I've demonstrated some modulation that affects all the oscillators at the same time. But let's take a look at these a little independent ones down the bottom here. So let's unmute our signal. We can either we can adjust all three of the oscillators independently. But let's take the envelope generator through our patch cable and stick it into the first CV input. And you can hear how the first oscillator is being affected by the envelope generator, but the second and third ones are still just producing that constant tone. And what happens here if we switch it to unison? And now it acts much like these ones, where it affects all three of the same oscillators, all the oscillators at the same time. But let's take that back to independent. Leave that one doing the same thing. We'll take the L phone. Oops, sorry. And we'll stick.
stick there. I'm gonna do this one. So let's unmute all the let's mute all these signals. And let's break it down. So this red cable, our first oscillator, is being affected by the envelope generator. Our blue cable is being affected by the LFO. And our green cable, that's just producing constant tone. Alright, that's getting very annoying. Let's mute that. So the last thing we have left to demonstrate on the TTO is just the white noise generator up here. So if I take our cable for the recording and stick it straight in, you hear white noise. So now that we've had a listen to what the TTO can do, I think we should have a look at the circuit diagram. I'm thinking first I'll draw a block diagram to show our various modules, I guess you could say, within the circuit. And then I'll show what's inside those black boxes and build up a picture of the noise toaster. And then from that, we can build up an even bigger picture to demonstrate how the TTO works. All right, so I've drawn our block diagram. Much like the mixer, we have an inverting summing amplifier where we can set the initial frequency and also apply our modulation sources such as the LFO or the envelope generator. The voltage from the inverting summing amplifier is then taken to the linear voltage to exponential current converter, or the LVT, which basically transforms the linear current coming from the summing amplifier and converts it into an exponential current. This current is then used to drive the ramp wave generator, where we can also apply our sync input. And in turn, the ramp wave generator then also drives the square wave generator. And up here separately in a different black box, we also have the white noise generator. As you can see, there was an insane amount of circuitry to the noise toaster oscillator, but I'll try and keep it simple. I might even use this highlighter up here so we can see which part is which. So this part I'm highlighting just here is our inverting voltage summer. We can see our pots being used for the frequency, the LFO input, and the EG or AR input. In the noise toaster, the LFO and the EG are hardwired directly to the top of the pots, whereas in the TTO these connections have been broken out into the jacks, so that it only applies modulation once we connect a patch cable. But even when we have no modulation applied, the LFO and the EG depth pots can, can still affect the range of the frequency due to the nature of a summing amp. We can see how the frequency pot goes between battery negative and battery positive, so that we can apply the full range of voltage to adjust the frequency range. Now remember how I said the LFO and EG inputs have different responses in the TTO? This is because the LFO is wired between battery negative and the top of the signal, whereas on the EG pot it is wired between virtual ground and the top of the signal. So they both work in different voltage realms to adjust the modulation effect on the frequency. We then have each pot's middle leg connected to a summing resistor you can see that the values are all a bit different due to how much of an effect that they have on the frequency. We also have this resistor here for biasing, just to push the summer a bit more towards 12 volt. This feedback resistor here as well sets the summer's gain quite low. For example, the 100k input resistor results in a gain of 1 50th. This is because the LV tech only needs a very small change in voltage to affect the frequency of the oscillator. When the output of our summer changes by about 18 millivolt up or down, it can actually shift the frequency by a whole octave. Now down here, just quickly, we also have our own virtual ground circuitry to prevent the oscillator from being spuriously modulated by any other modules, with a couple of caps for stabilisation as well. Rather than connecting it to the same virtual ground point as what all the jacks and the pots are wired to. So next we move on to the LV tech, which is this part that I'm highlighting here. Now I'm not going to go into the absolute nitty gritty, because it's complicated as all hell, but basically each 18 millivolt increase into the basic Q3 here causes Q4 to sink twice as much current. So for example, if Q3 has 18 millivolt at its base, and it's causing Q4 to sink 2 microamp, then increasing the base voltage to 36 millivolt 
will then cause Q4 to draw 4 micro amp. So for each 18 millivolt increase into Q3's base, we effectively double the current that is sunk by Q4. Now we should note that this is only a rough approximation, unless we have perfectly matched transistors and temperature compensation, which is what I was talking about earlier with some of the modules being iffy with temperature fluctuations. We can actually increase the frequency of the oscillator just by warming up the transistors with our fingers. So if the frequency pot is set to its midway point and producing say a 2000 Hz tone at 25 degrees Celsius, then the frequency will shift from that point depending on how much of a temperature fluctuation we have. But like I said, these modules are low-fi, so I'm not expecting to have a perfect frequency from the TTO every time I turn the machine on. So with all that being said, what's the point of this whole conversion process? Well, it comes down to the way that we perceive frequency and pitch as humans. We notice a much more definite change in pitch if we have a tone that goes from 200Hz to 400Hz. Whereas a change of 200Hz to 201Hz, well good god you would have to be superhuman to perceive such a subtle difference. So moving on to the ramp wave generator, which is this part that I'm highlighting here. The current sunk by Q4 is what controls the frequency of the ramp wave generator. So as current sinks into the collector of Q4, it also pulls current out of this op amp here, which is wired as an integrator. This current pull causes the output of the integrator to ramp up at a rate depending on how much current is being sunk by Q4. So when we have less current, the output ramps up more slowly, and when we have more current, it ramps up faster. So this is what allows us to affect the frequency with our control voltage sources. So we have the integrator creating a ramping voltage, but now the problem is, how do we reset the integrator back to zero volts, or the start, so that we can produce an oscillation? This is where this part of the ramp wave generator comes into play. We have this op amp here wired as a comparator, whose threshold voltage is made up of this resistor divider, creating a voltage of 5.4 volt with respect to actual ground, or 0.9 volt with respect to virtual ground. So when the voltage level at the output of our integrator crosses over this threshold voltage, it causes the comparator to shoot from negative saturation to positive saturation. And we also have this feedback resistor here, just for a bit of stabilization, or hysteresis if we want to get fancy. So when the comparator is at positive saturation, which is at about 3 volt above virtual ground, it drives current through this diode and resistor here, which then turns on this N-channel JFET, which is kind of like a MOSFET, but a bit different, which then allows current to flow between its source and drain. This then causes the integrator cap to rapidly discharge, which lets our integrator to reset back to the start. Once the cap has been discharged, our comparator then shoots back in a negative saturation, which stops current flowing through the diode, therefore allowing this biasing resistor here to keep the JFET turned off. This now lets the integrator ramp up again, and the cycle continues indefinitely until we turn the power off. Before we move on to the square wave generator, let's quickly look at this part here for our sync signal. A very small, negative pulse is applied to the threshold of our comparator when the EG or any other CV goes low. This pulse is enough to reset the wave back to the start at zero volt, which can produce some interesting sounds like we heard earlier, as it contains elements of both the EG and the ramp wave. However, the effect is much more pronounced when we use a faster audio rate signal. So moving on to our square wave generator, which I am highlighting here, we use this op amp down here as another comparator to create our square wave. Both inputs are fed the voltage from the ramp wave generator, with the non-inverting input being fed the raw wave via this resistor. The inverting input is fed the average voltage of the ramp wave as we apply passive low pass filtering to it via this cap and resistor. When the amplitude of the ramp wave applied to the non-inverting input is above the average ramp wave voltage on the inverting input, the output of our comparator then shoots into positive saturation. And then when the amplitude of the ramp wave applied to the non-inverting input is below the average ramp wave voltage on the inverting input, the output of our comparator then shoots into negative saturation. Therefore we get a square wave that follows the same frequency as the ramp wave. The output of our comparator also has a voltage divider comprised of these two resistors here, which reduces the amplitude of the square wave. This is why I'm struggling to demo the square wave. It just doesn't have the same oomph as the ramp wave. 
For the life of me, I have no idea why Ray decided to do this. I did actually change some of the values around to increase the amplitude when I was breadboarding the oscillator, but then when I designed the TTO PCB, I went back to the original resistor values, just in case it produced some spurious behaviour when I scaled it up to 12 volt. But I might pull it back out one day and change them around again. It's just going to be a pain in the butt to do because all the wires for the jacks, pots and switches are very tight and holding the PCB in place. So it's hard to get in under it to desolder and then resolder any new components in. So finally, last but not least, we come to the white noise generator, which I am highlighting here. This is the part that produces our shh noise, like the sound of an old untuned TV playing the snow channel, for those of you old enough to remember. What we basically have is an NPN transistor, and we can see that its collector leg is actually disconnected entirely. It has its emitter to base voltage exceeded, which causes it to act like a Zener diode and produce white noise. The problem is that it's such low amplitude that it needs to be boosted quite significantly before we can start hearing it through some speakers. That's what these transistors are here for, which I'm not going to go into detail with because, let's be real, transistor amps are way more complicated than just using an op amp, but they basically work as a two-stage transistor amplifier and boost the white noise to about 1.5 volt. When I was experimenting, even at 1.5 volt, the white noise just seemed a bit wimpy. So when it came time to designing the TTO, I actually had a spare op-amp left from the square wave generators. So I used that one to boost the white noise even further, which seemed to give it a bit more oomph, and we can actually hear it a bit better now. So we finally built up a picture of the noise toaster oscillator, and now it's time to scale it up to the TTO and see how that works. When I was originally breadboarding the noise toaster oscillator, I actually had a spare op amp chip, so I decided to build a second oscillator and just see what it would sound like to mix the two signals together and all that sort of thing. And it sounded really cool, but I had a bit of a brainwave moment and wondered if it was possible to create a unison control, so I'd be able to control both oscillators at the same time. Which was also around the time that Sam was making his 1000 oscillator mega drone. So thanks for the inspiration, man. With two oscillators, it was actually relatively simple. All I had to do was just move a couple of wires around and I was able to control both oscillators with just the one knob. But then I had to take it a step further and create three oscillators and see if I could do the same thing, which was way more complicated than I thought it was going to be. So let's jump on a keycad and we can have a look at how I designed the simpler aspects of the TTO, such as the CV sources that control all three oscillators at the same time. Then we can have a look at the dedicated unison control. So looking at the TTO circuit here, we can see that we effectively have three copies of the noise toaster oscillator. But let's first have a look at the modulation sources first, and we can see how they have been wired. As you can see, all that I have done is wire the LFO and envelope generator jacks, or controls, just directly down to the second and third oscillators. And I honestly didn't know if this was going to work until I put the whole module together and turned it on for the first time, which it didn't. Turns out I missed a few ground connections on the PCB design, so that was a pretty easy fix. Praise to Lord Electron. But once I sorted that issue, it appeared that the mod controls were affecting all three oscillators the way they should be, so I'm not complaining. And we have the same setup with our sync input. We just wire all three of the sync controls together so that it only needs one input to affect all three at once. And taking a look at our individual CV sources for each oscillator, we can see that I have actually just used a switching jack connected to the top of our frequency pods so that when nothing is plugged in, the pod is still connected to 12 volts and we can adjust the frequency normally. But as soon as we plug a CV source in, it breaks the connection and the top of the pot is now connected to our CV source. So we can affect the range of modulation on the frequency just by moving its respective knob. And just over here, we can see our white noise generator, with the op amp being used to boost the signal quite significantly. So these aspects of the TTO are all relatively simple to understand. But it's the unison control that turned my brain to mush trying to nut it out. But once I got there, I was quite literally jumping for joy. I just could not believe that it actually worked. But looking at KeyCat, it's not exactly intuitive what's going on with these inverters or these analog switches that are controlling all of the oscillators. 
So let's go back to our whiteboard and I'll show you how I was able to implement the unison control. So I've drawn a nice big close up of our unison control circuitry. And I don't know why I didn't do a shot like this sooner, but the circuit looks way more complicated than it actually is. But what we basically have is this series of 4066 analog switches that either turn on or off depending on if we want the TTO set to independent or unison mode. These switches are controlled by a series of 4049 inverters that is then in turn controlled by a double pole double throw switch down here which either sends 12 volt or 0 volts or ground to the inverters or directly to the switches depending on what control signals we want. So how exactly does each of these modes work? During independent mode, we want these two switches here to turn off. So the no signal is connected directly from the first frequency control pot. But we want these two switches here to turn on. So that oscillators 2 and 3 are connected to their respective circuits through the summing resistors. So if we follow these traces here, from the independent poles of the double pole double throw switch, we can see how each respective switch is either turned on or off directly or through an inverter to flip the control signal. And during unison mode, we effectively do the opposite. We want these switches here to be turned on so that the first oscillator frequency pot can control all three oscillators at once. But we want these switches down here to turn off so that the pots for oscillators two and three are disconnected entirely and therefore have no control over their oscillator circuit's frequencies. Again, if we follow the unison poles from the double pole double throw switch, we can see how each respective analog switch is either turned on or off directly or through the inverters again. So you see what I mean? It's actually pretty simple. I mean, it seems like it now, but I think I spent something like a whole day just playing around and slowly building up the control for it all. I knew it had to work, it was just a matter of how I could make it happen. So as you can probably tell, designing the TTO PCB was an absolute monster. I think it took two to three months from start to finish, but there was just no way I was going to be able to use prototyping board or strip board or anything like that. I mean, I could have, but it would have looked terrible and been sketchy as all hell. I want to use another couple of these boards though, for a few ideas I have in mind. I'm thinking I might change a couple of the integrated cap values around, so I could make a triple toasted LFO, or even have the value scaled, so I have 0.001 UF, 0.01 UF, 0.1 UF, you get the idea. Alright, so we finally finished talking about everything we possibly can with the TTO. Sam, and did you finish talking about that noise box thing? Oh crap, but you look at the time. I don't think we're going to have time to talk about the MS-20 filter today. Join me next time where we'll start having a look at how we can shape the sounds from the TTO through the filter and create some pretty spacey sounds. See ya!